Hello, hello, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, joined as always by Nick Horwat here, and, and we say at the beginning of every episode, it is the dog days of summer, but at the same exact time, we've been getting one move to sustain us for every episode for the past two weeks, and this time, that one move is the signing, or re-signing, I should say, of Danton Heinen. Uh, somebody who the Penguins initially did not tender a qualifying offer to, reportedly due to them being afraid of, of the potential awarding that Heinen would have gotten in salary arbitration, which was a little over $3 million. Instead, he returns to the Pittsburgh Penguins on a one-year deal for $1 million, which is a pay cut from the $1.1 million he made last year. And he adds to the bottom six issue. I mean, he helps the bottom six issue is what I should be saying. So Horwat, I, this was a very big surprise to me to see that Heinen was coming back at a pay cut. What did you think whenever you saw this come across the ticker? Legitimately, my first thought um, was, wow, Kasperi Kapanen is still on our team. <laughs> my second thought was, what did I say? What did I say? I said, Dan Heinen is going to sign for less money than that. And yeah. he did. And not only that, he did it here. I'm happy he signed. Don't get me wrong. I'm extremely happy Dan Heinen is back in a Pittsburgh Penguins uniform. I am just unable to stop myself from comparing it to the fact that Kasperi Kapanen signed a bigger and longer deal despite the seasons they had. We discussed the entire time of the initially when RFAs were getting um, talked about the idea that you can have one or the other. Ron said, why not both? And I'm a mm -hmm. little upset at that. That's all. Well, I think when you look at it in totality, and we're going to look at this as a specific deal in a minute here, but when you look at those two players in totality, the two signings that have been made over the past calendar week, it is Sperry Kapanen and Danton Heinen for $4.2 million. When you look at it that way, that's pretty good, but you would expect it to either be two and two or Danton Heinen to be the guy making $3 million after scoring 18 goals, 15 of them at five on five last season. But nonetheless, when you look at it overall, I, I think it's a pretty good move by Ron Hextall to sign Heinen to that contract. And it kind of takes the blow off, I think, of what we saw him do with Kasperi Kapanen, which we both agreed on Monday's episode that it was an overpay. So getting Heinen back at $1 million kind of makes up for that in my eyes, at least. It kind of does. It, if you would have flipped deals and said, hey, Heinen made 3-2 two for two years and Kapanen made one for one, cool. Yeah, I have no problem with that because it makes sense that Kapanen is making that that little money. Again, it's I'm happy Heinen is back. My only real issue is the fact that we had discussed it's either going to be, it has to be one or the other, right? It has to be. Or they both get different sorts of deals. Well, they ended up pretty much getting their same exact contract again. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dine, Heinen taking a minor pay cut for, again, just a singular year, um, it it's not a show me contract again, but it is something similar to what he just had. Whereas Kapanen, the exact same dollar amount for two extra years. So mm -hmm. I'm excited about Heinen. Yes. I'm just not going to be able to stop comparing it to Kapanen all season. Hopefully my brain gets over that quickly. Mm -hmm. I think when you have to look at this, you have to think about the fact that you, you just said it, the penguins get these guys back for basically the same deals they were on last mm -hmm. season and you look at the production from last season Danton Heinen are we expecting him to be an 18 to 20 goal guy again it'd be nice to say but we can't expect him realistically to go out there especially if he's only playing the minutes that he played last season because he did all of this while playing the like least amount of anybody in that range at five on five so he played the least amount and he produced the most, and he also had over, I think it was 13% shooting percentage. So he might take a little bit of a regression, but also on Kapanen's end, and we talked about it on Monday, we fully expect, at least I fully expect, Kasperi Kapanen to be better than he was last season. I, I think it would be hard-pressed for Kapanen to follow up what he did last season with something the same amount or worse. So you're going to get similar, if not better, results from those two for the same cap number, which at the end of the day, I think that's a really good move on Ron Hextall's part, especially whenever you look at the fact of what was this bottom six without Kapanen and Heinen? 
before these two moves a couple weeks back, this bottom six, I mean, it, it, it's not all cured now. But if you look at the bottom six the way it is now versus what it was, let's say, eight to ten days ago, it is 100% better. I mean, it is 1,000% yeah. better. So I think when you look at the way that Hextall was able to get these two guys back on the same deals, it, it was a shrewd piece of business. Yeah, it, it, the the deals and the their re-signings definitely do make the bottom six better. Um, but almost at what cost? Because while the bottom six is improved, yes, having Heinen back, it improves the bottom six. Mm-hmm. Having Kapanen there improves the bottom six over certain people. Um, we are the only thing, though, and me, you, and Doug talked about it for a split second. We are an Evan Rodriguez away from having literally 12 for 12 forwards back from last season. Mm-hmm. I don't like that. And that is a, my personal opinion that I, I wanted to see a little bit of change on this team. It, it, I keep going back to that definition of insanity thing. It's you're trying the same thing over and over again, hoping it'll work. Now, granted, I'll kind of give last postseason a pass on that, mm-hmm. but I just don't think keeping the exact same 12 is the correct answer. I, I just wanted to see even like two or three names changed out. I get that, you know, re-signing Malk and Rust and Raquel. It didn't handcuff them to keeping the same 12 around, but those were clearly the priorities, and that's perfectly okay. Mm-hmm. It just really hampered your ability to find new people. Uh, mm-hmm. Not R- or not UFAing Kapanen did that. UFAing Heinen, but then bringing him back for the same number did that, but then also... You know, you wanted to add Josh Archibald in there. You wanted to add Ryan Bailing in there from a trade. And things got weird, I guess. But I wanted to see a little bit of change down there. Yeah. And maybe there's still time for that. Again, we are still over the salary cap. I'm just reading into the mm-hmm. into the into what we have now, into the 20 names on our roster now. 23? Mm-hmm. However many it is. Yeah. it's That's what I'm reading into. And it's I'm overthinking it, overanalyzing it. But that's what we do in – late july (laughs) am i right yeah that's exactly what you do especially you you mentioned it according to cap friendly the pittsburgh penguins are currently 1.48 million dollars over the nhl salary cap which is at 82 and a half heading into this season a one million dollar bump from last year but the penguins are also at 24 players on their active roster where the limit is 23 so you know somebody's obviously has to get sent down and i do think there's something else that has to be coming I talked with Seth Rorabaugh of the Tribune Review on yesterday's episode of Penguins Lunch. We talked about Heinen and Rodriguez and how the Penguins might circle back to them like two hours before the Heinen signing. And the interesting thing was when I was talking to Seth, he highlighted the fact that, hey, if Mike Sullivan had the decision to make, he would love to have Evan Rodriguez back. Like Mike Sullivan absolutely adores having Evan Rodriguez on his roster. So I wouldn't technically think it's going to happen considering where the penguins are at when it comes to their lineup and we'll talk about the lineup in a second but when you look at and you mentioned the the running it back i do think that it's a couple of things here one they should have won that first round series we've said it so many different times they should have won that series against the new york rangers if it wasn't for crosby's injury raquel's injury and Jari and DeSmith. Like the, right. the fact that they were down to Louis Domingue and Net also hampered them as well. So I, I think that's something you have to look at and say, okay, they would have been in the, at least the second round with that lineup. And secondly, you didn't really get that much time with Ricard Raquel. And his addition changes the lineup so vastly because it solidifies the top six in a way that it wasn't before that trade was made. So I do think it's a lot different whenever you look at the lineup and we can bring it up here. This is what I have as the prospected lineup as of right now. I know people have it different ways. Our pens poll for next week will we'll sh- say that's differently. But for our, our listeners that aren't watching this on YouTube at Inside the Penguins, the lineup that we have forward-wise has one open spot, and that is fourth line left wing. We have the top six of Gensel, Crosby, Raquel, Zucker, Malkin, Rust. That's, I think, undoubtedly the six names that'll be up there, whichever formation we'll talk about that on Monday. But then the third line now is Heinen, Carter, Kapanen, which is a hundred times better than what we saw heading into this week, Mm -hmm. or I should say before the Kapanen signing late last week. And then on your fourth line, you have Bluger and McGinn, and then a question mark at at fourth line left wing, or it could be right wing 
because McGinn plays either either side. So let me ask you this, Warwat. With that one roster spot remaining, there are so many names that could fill it in. Who do you think would fill in that spot on the roster? Uh, for the love of God, somebody new. <laughs> I just want to see a fresh face or two. I get we're going to have a ton of that on the defense. Um, running down some of these names here, I think Alex Nylander maybe. Drew O'Connor supposed to have a good fight for a lineup spot. Mm-hmm. Um, even Drake Kajula. I'm very. I've said it last episode. I'm very interested in what he can do in this on this team. Um, Ryan Paling supposed to help again. Every single name here is a uh, a name we've discussed possibly being in our bottom six. Mm-hmm. If I had to just pick one, I think if I just to put my money on it, I would place it down on. I don't know the betting odds on this. Someone get on that. <laughs> uh, Drew O'Connor is going to find that last spot. When I look at these names, obviously, like we mentioned before, last Friday, there was three of these guys that would have had to be in the lineup for the Penguins to fill out a lineup. So the fact that it's down to one is a good sign for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Let's not lie about that fact. But when I look at this list, you know, Drew O'Connor, Ryan Paling, you talked about, you said you like Drake Kajula, Josh Archibald is in that mix, so is Redeem Zahorna and Alex Nylander. But when you look at these names, even though I think they're all supposedly going to get a fair shake at trying to win that last spot. I see Drake Kajul and Josh Archibald as the replacements for Brian Boyle and Anthony Angelo, basically. That, that, that's how I see them. Guys that are injury replacements and guys that will, not even Brian Boyle, because I don't think either of them will be at the NHL level to start the season. I think it's really between Drew O'Connor and Ryan Paling. And I would think that O'Connor has a little bit of a, of a leg up just because he's been in the system. Sullivan does like him a lot, but Paling, why else would you have brought him in here? If not to be a guy that goes on the fourth line, he can, I believe he can kill penalties. I, I have to double check that. I'm just blanking on it right now, but he has a little bit of a scoring touch and it's kind of unprecedented how quickly that went away in Montreal. So if he regains it there, maybe that's a scoring touch for the for the Penguins' fourth line to go along with Bluger and McGinn. So I think it's between O'Connor and Paling, and right now I would give the leg up, honestly, to Paling. I think he would end up winning that, even though going into training camp, O'Connor has a little bit of an advantage. Yeah, I, you're totally right about O'Connor having the advantage. I wouldn't wouldn't mind seeing Paling again because it's a new face. It's some something fresh for the, especially for the bottom six, which you're kind of supposed to change in and out every year. Um. But I just always get stuck on guys that uh, Hextall or Sullivan hasn't spoken at all yet, but guys that Hextall or coaches speak of by name, Mm -hmm. which was Josh Archibald at one point, which was Drew O'Connor at one point. So uh, I I will usually stick to those guys first, but Ryan Paling, I don't hate either. Uh, It probably is going to come down to O'Connor or Paling, though. And I think whenever you look at the actual roster, let me pull that back up here for for those fine folks over on YouTube. But you look at the defense. Again, this is just something that we have put together. Dumo Latang, Ruda Petri, Pedersen, Ruedel. Realistically, you could probably switch Ruda and Pedersen. You could switch Ruda, Pedersen, put in Ty Smith and take Ruedel out. There's a lot of different things that you can do and we'll see whenever training camp comes around in late September. But... I think when you look at this roster, even though it is pretty similar on the front end, I think this is a roster that would be as good, if not better, than what we saw from the Pittsburgh Penguins last season, just considering the fact that Jason Zucker, if he can stay healthy, is so much better than than what they got out of him last year. Brock McGinn, I I think if he can get consistent play, and I wrote a story about that for Inside the Penguins, he's going to be a lot better than what we saw of last year. And same with Kapanen, like there's no way he could be that bad and a full year of Ricard Raquel can only mean good things in my opinion. So I I think this is a a roster and a lineup that is as good, if not better than what we saw from the Penguins last season. And that's a Penguins team that should have been in at least the second round, potentially even the Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah, I I totally agree. It's definitely going to be just as good. I don't know about better. I do not know about better just because uh, the the, just because a lot of the Metro has gotten good around us. Mm-hmm. A lot of other teams stacked up in very fun ways. Every time I see another Metro team or another team in the East do something, I think, dang it, we have to play them. Mm-hmm. You know, Kachuk going to Florida, we have to play them. Um, it's going to be interesting. It's I don't know if the team got better. We definitely stayed the same, and I'm okay with it for now. That is just my look on it, and – 
I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm excited to see Raquel for a whole season. That's what I have been begging for all year. Mm-hmm. I almost wanted that more than Malkin coming back. But Malkin is back, and that's just as cool and awesome. Mm-hmm. Carter Bluger down rest down the center. I don't mind that. I think I want those question marks to be a new name. I, that's my main mindset. I think for now, if it is a Drew O'Connor, perfectly fine. If it's a Ryan Paling, cool, new name. Let's give it a shot. Let's give it a go. Bottom six, and I'm excited to see new faces on the defense, especially considering how, I mean, the defense was kind of faulty at the end of last year. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, judged by the forward core, I would say we stayed about the same. I mean, they're literally the same names, so we stayed about the same. Mm-hmm. And then for the defense, I think it's an improvement. I mean, the fact that we could put up a full defense if we throw Ty Smith in there and Ruedel's not in it, nothing against Chad Ruedel, but it's an improvement. You also have Mark Freeman and P.O. Joseph. So I, I think P.O. Joseph, Joseph, yeah. Yeah, when you look at the depth of this team, especially to me, and it's nothing against, you know, Josh Archibald. Drake Kajula, I know you're excited to see what he has yeah. left in the tank. But the better thing is, is they're not the first guy in now. Yes. The, the, this Heinen signing makes it so either Paling or O'Connor ends up being the first guy in, which to me is a lot more comfortable than having it be a Drake Kajula, a Josh Archibald, uh, making it have to be Redeem Zahorna or have to be Alex Nylander. This time, they can choose. They can pick and choose who's playing the best, when you look at your schedule, who do you need more? Do you need a bigger body? Okay, Redeem Zahorna. Mm-hmm. Do you need somebody that has NHL experience? Okay, Alex Nylander. Do you need somebody that's a little bit quicker, a little bit faster, and plays with a little bit more of an edge? Josh Archibald. You're going to have options in that in that sense. And, and the same thing goes with Paling and O'Connor. I know they're both a little bit bigger human beings, uh, Paling a little bit bigger than O'Connor. But you can kind of mix and match based on what you have to go up against and whoever's honestly, if you want to ride the hot hand, which is what Mike Sullivan likes to do. And the last thing I'll say on this entire thing is, yes, the forward core might be very much the same. But the with the caveat of, of health, if they're healthy, let's not forget, Malkin scored 20 goals in 41 games. Yes. He, he had a 40-goal pace last season. So if these guys can stay healthy and play consistently, which is a big if in, in some of these cases, they are mostly all over or close to the age of 30. But if they can stay healthy, I'm very confident that this team will be better than it was last season. It totally can be. It totally can be. That is a big caveat. I understand that. But like, if yeah. they are, then I see the potential for this team being better. Yeah, I, I think this team can improve. If they're... The uh, a couple of the correct positions could be getting better too, in, in, in goaltending and Tristan Jari, mm-hmm. and uh, the bottom six. Ha- if we discover someone down there who can really do something and make a difference, because the bottom six scoring dried up last season, and that was a big issue. Mm-hmm. So if we're able to get some life out of it, whether it be from a same name, whether it be from a Danton Hine and sticking around, or let's say even Rodriguez comes back and finds that old form somehow, some way. Mm-hmm. Then there is then there is at least life down there, uh, because that was one of the big downfalls of the end of the season into the postseason was the fact that that bottom six could not do anything. Yeah. So no matter who it is down there, as long as we can get life out of that, doesn't matter. That is success. Mm-hmm. It's a successful team and imp- and an improved forward core. The defense, while it is new newer, and everyone's going to kind of be in new spots, that one should be interesting. Mm-hmm. I think it's better defensively, and I don't think they sacrificed too much on offense. I know Mike Mathis and the Jeff Petrie is a weird offensive uh, switch, but I, I don't think they sacrificed too much offensively to get a little bit better in their own zone. But we're going to take a quick break. When we return, we threw up a random tweet on our Twitter at Iceberg Podcast, and it blew up. So we're going to discuss it right after the break. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. Make sure you bookmark that for all of the latest news, stories, best pens talk from me, Nick Berlansky, my buddy Nick Horwat, as well as Noah Strackbein, Jacob Punturi, and Cody Flavel, as we have a great, great staff there at InsideThePenguins.com. And we're just getting started as we launched back in May, just at the beginning of the NHL postseason. So, 
awesome content coming out throughout the entirety of the offseason. Check it out at InsideThePenguins.com and at Inside the Penguins on youtube but let's continue to talk here about a random tweet that horwat i threw up when i was half asleep because i was making something and a post for instagram and i said you know what it's so easy let's just throw it up on twitter as well and all of a sudden there's over 150 comments 170 likes or something like that people are going at it in the comments section and the question was basically which of these former penguins would help out this year's team the most i didn't put caveats like salary cap like hey was it when they played for the penguins or is it now I, I didn't do any of that that was all figured out by people who commented let's put these caveats on it it does matter about the salary cap yep and it is current day i know a, lo- a couple other people were like oh phil kessel oh mark andre fleury those weren't options but i appreciate the input <laughs> some people said i think somebody put john pronovo and rick kehoe i'm like okay good well, answers great answers <laughs> I saw no I saw no Ryan Whitney, no Biz Nasty. So we didn't have people that like spitting chicklets in the comment section, but we had, you know, Mario Lemieux was in there, Rick Tockett was an answer. But the four actual options were Jared McCann, Patrick Hornfist, Brandon Tanev, and Carl Haglin. All former penguins, all still playing in the National Hockey League, still viable options as National Hockey League players. Not to say that Mario Mew couldn't go out there and spit out 30 goals randomly, but which of these former Penguins do you think or what would help out the current team the most? Right off the jump, I'm going to have to have to cross out Carl Haglund. Sorry. Uh, just he, I don't think he has the same stuff that he used to. Well, he I mean, also had an eye injury all of last season. Okay. Okay. So, that's- that like, may be part of it, but I don't know if just being on a different team kind of deteriorated him. I forget where he went. What was it, Washington at one point? He's in uh, Washington still. He's in Washington now? Okay. Yeah. He just doesn't seem like the same player, so I'm going to cross him off first. Well, and here's the other thing before you keep going. Sorry to interrupt. You're good. He's, he's basically the same player as Brandon Tanev, but I feel like Tanev does a little bit more. He's, he's more of an energy guy. He's more of yeah. a four-check guy. He's a penalty killer. That's what both of these guys do, but I think Tanev is that – that energy energizer bunny guy. So that's why I cross Haglin out, even though if you've listened to this show for the past, this is heading into its fourth season. Oh boy. You know that Carl Haglin was one of my favorites and I have a Penguins Carl Haglin jersey, but uh, I will cross him off as well, but continue. Uh, yeah. Um, regardless though, I think, I think I would have to bring back uh, Jared McCann because I would assume then that, well, this is, I mean, how many times did we see on Twitter last year? Man, Jared McCann can really help this team right now. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to make this my answer, but it just kind of has to be because I, they're all correct. Every time you see that tweet, it's right how much he could help this team right now because having him on this team presumes that uh, Jeff Carter is not on this team, and that is already a bonus because it is a younger player. I don't know salaries off the top of my head, but mm-hmm. it's a younger player who might – have a brighter future who has a bit of a scoring touch and that's what we lost. He helps out the bottom six scoring because that's what that's what we needed. That's mm-hmm. that was kind of my closing point to the last uh little segment we just did is that our bottom six scoring just dried up completely and that is that was part of the downfall at the end of the season and what made the postseason a hard pill to swallow. The fact mm-hmm. that that bottom six couldn't do anything. So now throwing in a Jared McCann over a Jeff Carter you gain some speed. You gain some youth and maybe a little more scoring. You can't take McCann's cracking numbers into, into, into case here. Yeah. Because I mean, what was he on the top line there? He's on the top power play. Definitely. I, I don't know if he was the top line or the second line for the Kraken. Yeah. He had different ice time over there. So you can, you don't take the numbers in, but you take just the ability. You just kind of have to take the eye test in and know his eye test looks better than current day Jeff Carter. Mm-hmm. And the one number you would have to take into account is that salary cap number, because that's yes. how we're, we're doing this exercise. He just signed a five year, $5 million contract per season. So five years is $25 million. So when I look at that and I wouldn't take Jeff Carter out of the lineup necessarily. Oh, okay. What I would do if it was Jared McCann, because I, I think that is my answer as well as Jared McCann, because you need scoring. If you're the Pittsburgh Penguins, you need somebody that can bump into that top six. And especially if one of the centers go down between Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin, which you never hope to happen, but sometimes does, especially if you look at last season, 
But when I look at Jared McCann, what I would do if I was able to do NHL GM mode and do forced trades on NHL 23, Jared McCann comes back to the Penguins. The Penguins send out, and it's not because I don't like this player. It's not because I'm trying to get this player out, but it's the one that seems the most reasonable. The Penguins send out Jason Zucker Mm -hmm. and a first round pick. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. For for Jared McCann, which at the end of the day, if Ron Hextall did that, he would look like a complete and utter idiot because he gave out Jared McCann for free and then ended up trading a first round pick to get him back. But if you get McCann instead of Zucker, if that's the exchange and then whatever else is used to make it work, you can put McCann as your third line center. You can put Carter as your third line left wing. Mm Mm-hmm. And you can put Danton Heinen as your second line left wing. And all of a sudden, I think that's a better lineup with the opportunity that if somebody goes down, you know Jared McCann can fill that role. It's the center position. Correct. Or a wing position if you really need him to. Yep. And you could bump, bounce Carter right back to a third oh. line center. Yeah. yeah. That's why That's why I like McCann is because he's kind of like a Swiss Army knife. And he's he the- has potential to score 15 to 20 goals. The versatility. That was one of the things we loved about him in the first place is that, hey, no matter what spot in the lineup he is, whether it be center or wing, he's got the same ability there's nothing's getting taken away one way or the other the versatility is huge there and i think that is the far and away best option here i mean hornquist just keeps getting older and we know he's plays plays a harder game mm-hmm. sure we could use a big net front presence but i think jake etzel's filling in just fine and we've kind of molded our game to not need it mm-hmm. in, in the best way possible um and brandon tanev i just think I mean, he's coming off a big leg injury, mm-hmm. and I don't know. We just need a little more production, just a little bit more of a touch. As much as as much as he was so much, as much as he was fun to watch, as much as he uh, helped the team uh, stay positive and improve, you just need points, man. You just need to have that little extra scoring touch, and that's what Jeremy McCann brings more than Brandon Tanev does. Mm-hmm. And when you talk about Patrick Horn, just because he's the guy that we haven't really discussed too yeah. much in this segment. He does bring that net front presence, especially on the power play, which would be a nice addition because the Penguins don't have that. Gensel does go out to those areas, but a lot of the time it's just to kind of find the rebounds that squirt out a little bit further. I don't think he's doing exactly the same thing that Hornfist did, but he also brings a little bit of a scoring touch, does Hornfist, and leadership would be the big thing. If you bring him back into the room, he was vastly important as a leadership voice in that room, and that's what I think one of his biggest assets would be. But again... 35 years old for already the oldest team in the National Hockey League. That's why I think he drops on this list. If somebody overall said, hey, Patrick Hornfist at league minimum to the Pittsburgh Penguins, I'd say, you know what? That's fine. I would still be like, that's another old player. But when you look at the cap number that he has, when you look at the age that he is, when you look at where he would fit on this team, I don't see in the top six a place that you can realistically put Patrick Hornfist in. And we all know that he's not the same player when he's playing in the bottom six. He would essentially just be a power play net front guy for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yeah. Did you also know that as of right now, uh, unless unless Eric Stahl does sign sign a full contract off the PTO, he's the oldest player on the Florida Panthers? That's a young That's team sense. in reality, if you it think is. about it. Yeah. Um, and tra- trading Huberto and Uyghur and getting a younger player and Kachuk back helps that as well. Yeah, uh, he's 35, born January 1st, 1987. He's only like two weeks older than Mark Stahl. Which, by the way, the fact they signed both those Stahl brothers is weird. That's cool. Um, it's interesting. One of them do a PTO, one of them do a real contract. How do you feel? But, yeah, th- th- we'd be gaining age, which, again, I think we've done enough of <laughs> this year. Yeah. Don't you think? No offense yeah. to all of our re-signings, but, man, we're all on the wrong side of 30 here. Mm. So I think adding Hornquist, it does add a certain bite, but it just adds too much else that I don't want. Mm-hmm. I, I think Ryan Paling is, I'm not going to say Ryan Paling is exactly what Patrick Hornquist would bring you, but the, the net front presence, the big body, and somebody that's going to end up playing very low in your forward lineup at five on five, I, I get it's not the same thing, but... I think it's a little bit better of an option for the Pittsburgh Penguins as of right now. And, yeah. and, and Jared McCann is definitely the answer to, to me. I know there's a lot of people that, that agree with that. A lot of the 150 comment responses were Jared McCann. So I think everybody else would tend to agree as well. Yeah. But 
I don't know. We we threw that up. I guess we'll just keep throwing random stuff like that up on Twitter because it, it absolutely blew up. Hence the reason we're actually talking about it on the show. But let's move over and finish this episode off with shout outs and call outs. Horwat, I'll lead off this week with my shout out. I'm shouting out Starling Marte. I usually don't take the Mets very seriously. I don't think very many people that watch baseball take the Mets seriously until October and they're still in it because we saw what happened last year with the New York Mets. They ended up metting and, and they dropped completely out of the playoffs. But this year may be a little bit different. I mean, you, you look at the fact that they just got Scherzer back, they haven't had DeGrom, and they're still vastly ahead of, of the last playoff team out. It's basically them and the Braves in the NL East and then nobody else. So I think the Mets are a little bit better this year. And part of that is because Starling Marte is having a phenomenal season for the New York Mets in his first year in Flushing. 300 batting average, 10 home runs, 43 RBIs, and an 815 OPS. And yesterday in the Subway Series, which was probably one of the most fun regular season series I've seen in a long time, hits a walk-off single to sweep the Yankees in flushing for the New York Mets. Dude is vastly underrated as a whole. He has never really hit under 275 in a season, which is kind of crazy. And he's been in the league for 10 seasons now. When I saw the Pirates post about his MLB debut down in Houston, I was like, he's been in the league for 10 years. Now, part of that might be because he was suspended for basically an entire season. for Forgot about that. But the fact is he has been a very good outfielder, maybe not all-star level, but he's been a very good number one outfielder for a long time now. And I don't think he gets his just due. So I'm giving it here on the podcast. So my shout out is Starling Marte of the New York Mets. Yeah, shout out to the Mets. They're, they they seem to be good at baseball for now. For now. Man, uh, you, the most entertaining series you've seen. I don't know. Did you watch the Red Sox tr- attempt to play the game against either all, th- all three of those games against Toronto? I'll say most entertaining where both teams were actually playing good okay. baseball. That's not, not best, you know. It looked like a couple of playoff games. Yes, it I did. Get it. it makes me want that as the World Series. Oh, not again. <laughs> what was that, 2000 that happened? Yeah, it's it's been a while. Oh, man. Yeah, that'd be fun. That would be fun. Something about something about the biggest market in the game having both their teams in the series, you know. That, that, yeah. That's MLB winning. Yeah, and I'd like to see the Mets win if that's what ended up happening. I would, yeah. I would, I would go with the Mets. I'd like to see the Mets win, even though I kind of don't like Pete Alonso. But I don't like Pete Alonso either. I, that that whole trying to go, you know, stupid during the home run derby with that. St- I don't know. I, yeah. Somehow the baseball all star game got boring. Uh oh. Uh oh. Yeah. Well, We're the game, cr- the game itself was okay. Uh, the yeah. home run derby was okay. We're but... just in crisis mode in sport all star games. Yeah, it's still the best of the four, but... And it wasn't that great, so oh boy. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we're at the Mets. Yeah, the Mets are fun. Meet the Mets. Meet, meet the Mets. All righty, Horo, what's your shout-out this week? I do want to shout-out something from TV. Uh, that 70s show is one of the greatest sitcoms ever made. I don't care what anyone says. Fight me if you disagree. They're doing a That 90s show, ladies and gentlemen. And yeah. to make it really fun, the cast is coming back. All of the proper cast, at least given issues i don't know if Topher grace is also going to be there he's he didn't want to be there in the first place so mm-hmm. that one's a question mark i think he is though um mm-hmm. but i at least know wilmer uh mila and ashton and uh i kurtwood smith and i deborah joe rupp at least they will all be there and those are the mm-hmm. best characters anyway mm-hmm. i think laura prepon signed on as well this could be a ton of fun i think it's a netflix thing that would make a lot of sense it might not be though because they took that 70 show off of Netflix not too long ago, a little bit before the pandemic. We'll have to see. All I know is I'm excited about a reboot for once. This one could be a ton of fun. Um, and I don't know. That's just such a great show. I want to see what they do with it, especially since apparently shortly after the end of that 70 show, there was like four episodes of a show called That 80 Show mm-hmm. that fell apart miserably. But this one. You know, nowadays these things have, you know, production value and money going into it, and the returning actors. Mm-hmm. This could be interesting. This could be a ton of fun. I'm excited to see what the company, I forget which one it is exactly, does with it. Mm-hmm. I mean, Mila Kunis is currently producing and, and working on a show that is. Con- 
completely funded by NFTs. So there's oh, different boy. ways to do it. I believe it's called Stoner Cats. So I believe there's multiple different ways now that you can fund a show. But I'm excited for that too. I, I saw that. Didn't uh, didn't remember about it, but you know, you bring it up. I'm I'm excited to watch that as well. I like that 70s show. I wouldn't um, say it's the best one, but we can have that discussion. Oh, it's up there. It's up there. I, so from what the cast is showing on Twitter or on Twitter on Google, it is a Netflix thing. So hopefully okay. that 70s show also goes back to Netflix then. Mm -hmm. um, but Laura Prepon and Topher Grace are both on the cast list. And so is Tommy Chong. <laughs> so it's we we still have Leo. Aren't we all excited? I mean, I, it sounds like everybody but Danny Masterson. But uh, there's a reason. for good reason. There's a reason. But speaking of reasons to be upset at people, let's move over to call outs. And I'm going to call out Big Ben Roethlisberger. Oh, me for too. <laughs> every single reason that most people in Pittsburgh already know about because he spoke to Ron Cook of the Pittsburgh Post Gazette in an article that released on Friday and the I fan. Don't forget. He's part of the fan. Sorry. Had to get that plug in there and the fan. You're already wearing the Odyssey shirt. Uh, but I think big Ben is honestly incapable of just walking into the sunset. <laughs> he's burning every bridge on his way out. And it's really entertaining though. He's, he's going full Terry Bradshaw mode. He really is been retired for less than six months. And all of a sudden it's Terry Bradshaw 2.0. I mean, he, he went on to say Colbert didn't want me. Tomlin was ready to move on, but he was okay. And Mr. Rooney really wanted me back and then remembered to say, oh, I can also go out there and play right now. I thought I was really good last season. And, and listen, there are some times where his mind and his football sense and his experience helped win the Pittsburgh Steelers games. And without that experience, they would not have won the game. But there's also the fact that if they had somebody that has a little bit of a better arm, a little bit of more stamina a little bit of better what's the word i'm looking for legs youth? The, not youth i wasn't gonna go directly at his age oh, but a, a little bit better with their legs because the offensive line wasn't good the steelers might not have needed to get that deep into the game and needed him to come out and be the the veteran the wily veteran needed his mind because they had somebody that didn't trip over the 30 yard line and the hash marker when nobody was around him. So I didn't, I don't dislike Ben Roethlisberger, but when you're retired, I understand you're going to say stuff. Don't burn bridges. What is the purpose of, of saying this stuff? And the timing is the other thing. If he came yeah. out and said this in the middle of June, okay. It was still would have been like, Oh, that's a little off, but he said it the Friday before camp begins. Clearly he realized that everybody in Pittsburgh was talking about Mitch Trubisky, mm -hmm. Kenny Pickett, mm -hmm. and God forbid somebody talks about Mason Rudolph more than Big Ben. Oh, that was happening. And Big Ben, at the timing, was like, "Hey, don't forget, I, I played last year, and I, I need to be in the forefront heading into Steelers camp." But he, I mean, at the end of the day, Big Ben is the greatest Steelers quarterback of all time. I, I will say that. I think he's better than than Bradshaw. But just sit back and enjoy your retirement. And, and shut up for Christ's mm -hmm. sakes. I don't, I don't need to hear it, Ben. I really don't. Well, guess what? He's going to keep talking anyway. And the oh, funny he, thing is he, he is, and that's his right, but still like, shut up. <laughs> it's just, yeah. It's just burning every bridge on your way out. Like a true Steelers quarterback. Like, just had to complete the saga. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing next, excuse me, is him re-signing somewhere and playing another year, which I don't think he'll do. No. Um, but you never know. His buddy's out there somewhere. It's just, yeah, man, just burning every bridge on your way out. Some of the comments were a bit extreme. I mean, discussing how he felt good. Oh, you, you felt good. That's great. You looked crappy. You looked not good. Uh, sure, we got to the playoffs and had another winning season. Well, congratulations, man. This, this town is hungry for something more than that. Ask any of the teams. We're all hungry for something more than just a little po little uh, regular season success. Three playoff wins since they went to the Super Bowl in 2011. Three. That's not good. Somehow, Mike Tomlin's still here. Yeah. Yeah, let's know. be real here for a second. I, I listen when it comes to Tomlin, and, and that's an entirely like that. That might be a podcast for like a Steelers podcast, but like when it comes to Tomlin, I still think he's one of the best coaches in the National Football League. But I, I do think that I don't, I don't know if he has that killer instinct, the ability to outcoach somebody to win the game. 
he, he Tomlin's just gotten a little set in his ways because he knows he's coaching the Steelers and is not getting is not going anywhere until his mm-hmm. contract is up. Or yeah. he feels like retiring just because that's just the way the Steelers roll. Mm-hmm. But yeah, just burning every bridge on your way out to the point where Cam Hayward, of course, Cam Hayward, the ultimate captain. Um, you know, the one comment that got Cam Hayward rubbed in the wrong way, that's a quote, was the it, it's a me it's a me first attitude game, which mm-hmm. from an outsider's perspective, I think we all can see where he's coming from with that. Yeah. But he should know because he's not an outsider. He's in the locker room uh, and should be aware that that's not totally true with all 53, 54 guys in your mm-hmm. locker room. It's yeah. Are there a few that stand out? Sure. I think we can all say as fans that Antonio Brown was a little focused on himself. But ironically enough, Just ironically real. enough, though, I mean, maybe that's more recently, but Cam Hayward listed him by name as a guy that is team first. So. Mm-hmm. Man, I don't know. All I know is Cam Hayward did the best he could. He knows that he's the team's captain right now mm-hmm. and probably was even with Ben here just because that's just mm-hmm. how Ben rolled. Um, he knows he's going to have to be the one to front these questions, and he mm-hmm. already has. So good on him for being the classy individual and keeping this Steelers way alive in some mm-hmm. sort of capacity. So it's interesting, I think. Mm-hmm. Burning bridges on your way out is not good, but hey, you know what? If anything, now you just don't have to do broadcasts for us. Yeah, uh, I, I think the biggest thing when when Ben said the the me first mentality is that's your fault. <laughs> You're the, yes. the starting quarterback, and when you look at the people that are predominantly thought of as the me first Pittsburgh Steelers of the past, it's Martavis Bryant, Antonio yes. Brown, Le- Le'Veon Bell. Juju Smith-Schuster and Chase Claypool. That's all on the offense. I, I can't think of defensive players that were outwardly me first that you could literally just plop down on a Sunday, watch, and be like, yeah, there's that many me first players on the defense. No, no, you really couldn't. Because, I mean, Bud Dupree just wanted his money. Uh, and he went out and played. Yeah. Even, even TJ Watt last year did the whole, I'm showing up the training camp, I'm just going to practice on my own but still be here that's a little bit of but that's again nobody begrudges people for wanting to get their money but the way that it's handled ben it's all on the offense which you're the captain of yeah yeah if it's any reason it's yours it's because you didn't take the initiative to stand up so that's what gets me it's like ben saying oh it's it turned into me first the steelers way is is over it's like well that's your fault because if you're saying it it was not like that when you came in it's because other people were the heads of that locker room yeah and then they left and you were supposed to take over and instead it became what we saw with Le'Veon Bell and Antonio Brown which I think are are chief among the examples of two players saying I I wanted me first yeah and Cam Hayward I think did put in so many words that that was on Ben Uh, but also how about knocking on me first mentality whenever he's the one saying hey I can still do this me I can do this still yeah, the, enti- the entire article is self-serving. Yes. And I'm sure, you know what, it, it got, I'm sure it got a ton of clicks, got a ton of reads. We're talking about yeah. it here on a hockey podcast, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, for, for like 10 minutes. Yeah, we're, put, we're putting way too much in-depth into this. We, I mean, we're at the dead of summer when it comes to hockey stuff. I mean, we're worked up over a Dan Heine contract. Hey, I'm excited. Oh, I mean, we're excited. <laughs> we're worked up over the Kaepernick contract. There we go. But, man, what... <laughs> Man, we need hockey back, don't we? But no, it's I really appreciate the yeah, it became a me first game. Uh, but meanwhile, me first, I think I can still play. Mm-hmm. Ben, you're doing great, you're walking in circles now. <laughs> now, uh, go fishing, go golfing, do your thing. So, we just shouted you, I just shouted you out not too long ago for being a good golfer, didn't I? Did I not? Mm-hmm. You're gonna burn my bridge now. I don't think he cares about your bridge. No, but I work for a company he doesn't like, so it's okay. That's, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair enough. But, I mean, nonetheless, I'm excited to see there's football's back. I'm liking all the uh, the tweets and stuff. I was I just about I'm not a fan of there. the live tweeting, but, yeah, it's fun that they're back. The, the hey, live tweeting becomes a bit much sometimes. It's... Well, then you can just block the word Steelers on Twitter and be the most un or human being in, in the history of the world. It's just that it, – it's just that – I. Why did I have to know that Mitch Trubisky threw the ball four times? Oh, that was kind of funny. As it happened. It was Mitch Trubisky's first throw. 
His second throw. I'm like, I, I got it. I he's, yeah. he's he's getting the first person reps. We get it. Can we move on? And I don't care. Sum it up at the end, please. Yeah, that that was a bit much. I thought you were just saying like he went one for four, and then people started chanting for Pickett. I was like, okay, that was that's, hysterical. That's that was hysterical, hysterical. But I, I didn't know they were literally coming out and saying his first pass was an incomplete pass. Like we don't need the play by play. I I got play by play. I mean, maybe that's because I sit in front of Twitter at work because I need to. But um, I mean, goodness, we both do. Goodness gracious. Yeah. It's nice at the end of the day to be able to just turn off Twitter and put on do not disturb mode and be like, also, nobody talk to me anymore. I'm also kind of happy that there was no giant, massive people, like the big entries, because I always thought that was a little overrated. Like, congratulations, you rented out a truck, a, a big cement mixer or something to show up to Latrobe. Way to go. We're, we're getting a little too deep into all of this, but I do want to ask your quick opinion of Aaron Rodgers' entrance as Nick Cage from Con Air. Did I, I forget yeah, I did. I'm just going to leave it at the one tweet that I saw that made me laugh so hard. Man, Aaron Rodgers looks like the most divorced man ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was the greatest tweet because I don't care that much about Aaron Rodgers. I know. You're not a fan of Aaron Rodgers. I find some of the stuff he does is comical. Some of the stuff he does is obviously self-serving mm-hmm. as we were finishing talking about Ben Roethlisberger. But I think that puts a nice little bow on this episode. We'll be back on Monday with another episode of the Tip of the Iceberg podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. We will see you guys after the weekend. Have a great one, Pence fans.